the sunshine I'm doing my time to pay for my sin I count the cost but all is lost If heaven just won't let me in Hope was gone And freedom fall But then I miss Jesus behind bars Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the light And also, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thanks for listening to Jesus Behind Bars. And now, here's Philip Hicks. Welcome, everybody. Philip Hicks with Jesus Behind Bars. And I'm so honored to have you with me again today for Chapter 21. Yes, I had walked with the Lord for some time now, and and I was growing closer and closer to Him. But you know, I guess I've probably said this before, if I was walking on water, I'd be on mighty thin ice. I had gained the respect of a lot of my peers, brothers and, and the, uh, the chaplains and the, even the, a lot of the guards on that prison compound because they watched me just like we're all being watched. Scripture says that we're like living epistles, like little books. We're read and known of other people. They don't need to hear everything about Jesus. They just need to see Jesus through us. As I was growing in that grace, the Lord began to give me another pulpit from young Christians that would come into that chapel. If the chaplain was busy, they'd come in and ask advice from me. One young man named Javier came in and uh, we're connecting and he said, Brother Hicks, I've got a problem. And he, he just opened his heart to me. And here's what I said to him. Based on my experience from 1 Thessalonians that, uh, about giving thanks in all circumstances and passed down to me by Johnny Erickson, you recall, I said, brother, are you ready to give thanks in all circumstances? Because it says right here in the Bible that we should do that. And so he was a little uh, hesitant, but he prayed with me and he left. The next day I got a call from our newest chaplain there at, at Rayford at, at The Rock. His name was Victor Morgan. And man, this guy was full of God. He had the joy just bursting out of him. So we really connected. And he, I spent some time talking with him that previous week when he arrived. And, Next morning after I call, uh, counseled Javier, uh, Victor Morgan, Chaplain Morgan, brought me into his office. He said, Brother Hicks. I said, hello, Brother Morgan. And uh, He said, did you counsel a young man named Javier yesterday? I said, yeah, I did. I said, and did you encourage him to give thanks in all circumstances? I said, yes, I did. That works. It really worked. Worked in my life. He said, Brother Hicks, we're not all on the same step of that ladder in our walk with God. And Javier, just a young baby Christian, still drinking that milk. He wasn't ready to give thanks, and it probably went over his head. I appreciate your heart, Brother Hicks. I appreciate you so much. But I just encourage you, we need to be discerning and sensitive to everybody that we talk with and what we say to them. Because it's really easy to get spiritual indigestion and uh, lead a man just to give up if, if he's not able to do everything that he, the Bible says. Because, you know, this walk, it's a, it's a journey. It doesn't just happen today and go tomorrow. It's a journey. It's a process. So let's be encouraging to each, each person where they are in life. And I said, thank you, brother. I needed that. I pray this chapter encourages you very, very much. By the way, later on uh, in life, after I was miraculously released from prison, I was called to go for a year in prison ministry across America. Ended up in Florida. And I got to preach at the Florida, the Orlando, Florida church of my chaplain, former chaplain, Victor Morgan. And we had such a laugh as, as I reminded him about his encouragement to do that, that day. You know, we can't take things so serious. We need to lighten up. Maybe that's why Jesus says, take my yoke upon you because it's light and easy. We need to lighten up and enjoy this walk and not get so weighed down with this, that, and the other. Be who you are. Be who you are in Christ because he loves you just who you are. I'll be back with you soon. Chapter 20, Change is Good. It didn't take long to discover that Vic and I were the perfect roommates. We stayed busy and time flew by. Vic's job assignment was at the high school where he taught Spanish and English. We both enjoyed working out with weights and running, so we stayed in tip-top condition. It had been months since I had laid my crutches aside and my injured leg grew stronger by the day. Of course, Vic was already in condition when he came off the streets. After serving in the Marine Corps for four years, he returned to Miami where he worked as a lifeguard on Miami Beach, keeping in shape by lifting weights and practicing karate. A straight-A student at Miami-Dade Junior College, 
He continued his education at American University. During this time, he got busted. Vic and I began meeting another inmate named Tank three days a week at the weight pile to work out. One day, a fourth man joined our group. Just a little more. Come on, man. You got it. That's it. Praise the Lord. I shouted as Vic pushed the barbell upward one final time. Whoa, he grunted, the sweat pouring off of him. Man, that was 250 pounds, I exclaimed. I can do all things through Christ, said a beaming Vic. Yeah, but you hardly weigh 140 pounds, I added. Hey, do you guys mind if I join you? Questioned a voice from behind me. Turning around, I immediately recognized the owner of the strange voice, and quite frankly, I didn't know how to respond, because I didn't know what Vic would say. It was the same black guy who had been on Vic's case in front of the canteen several weeks earlier. What happened next kind of shocked me, and it sure made me proud of my new roommate. Sure, man, Victor said. You can do a set of benches now, because we're already done two sets ourselves. Here, I'll spot you. At first, I wasn't quite sure if Vic was going to drop the weights on the guy's head. Quietly, I began to pray. After our newest workout partner finished his set and his head was still intact, he turned to Vic and said, Thanks, man. While the new guy was spotting for Tank, Vic turned to me, smiled, and said, Well, Felipe, Jehovah really does make your enemies to be at peace with you. Turning to acknowledge Vic's outstretched high five, I said, See, si, hermano, see. Si. The fantastic chaplain who had water baptized me well over a year before, Chaplain Walker, had since left UCI to become head chaplain across the river at Florida State Prison, where death row is located. Talking to Chaplain Cornette one Monday morning, I asked, How's Chaplain Walker doing over at Florida State Prison? He's doing just fine, Brother Hicks, said the chaplain. Well, when are we going to get a new chaplain, I asked. He's due to arrive sometime next week. What's his name, I questioned. His name is Victor Morgan continued Chaplain Cornett, and this will be his first assignment as a prison chaplain. He's fresh out of seminary. One week later, I had the pleasure of being the first inmate to meet and talk with our new preacher, and I immediately knew this guy was for real. It was common knowledge in the chain gang that there were some chaplains who were unsaved and were working just to have a job. Later on, I learned that even on the streets, there are men working in churches that are not called to pastor, nor do they enjoy a personal relationship with God. Hello, brother exclaimed a warm, friendly, slim black man as he excitedly shook my hand. Chaplain Morgan, I said, we're awful glad to have you here. Glad to be here, brother, he responded. As we got to know each other, I learned Brother Morgan was raised in nearby Jacksonville, where he too had tried to find happiness in drugs and women, but the Spirit of God wouldn't let him get away. I was a member of the Church of God in Jesus Christ, said Brother Morgan. Well, that title sure covers all the bases, I said as we both laughed. Soon, Brother Morgan's lovely wife began attending Sunday morning chapel with us and would often bless us with singing. And speaking of singing, I doubt seriously if any prison in the entire state, or in the entire country for that matter, had as many ministry groups coming inside to bless and encourage us with so much singing and preaching. At least twice a year, the Bill Glass and Jim Wilson Crusades visited for two and three days at a time. Plus, A. Brown's prison group and several others visited annually. Campus Crusade for Christ also had a prison outreach called P.S. Ministries. P.S. Ministries was committed to discipling the lives of both men and women behind bars. Because of their in-depth approach and dedication to making certain new Christians became rooted and grounded in their faith, many never returned to prison after they left. One morning, I shared my testimony with Jim Marsh, the man who headed P.S. Ministries, and afterwards, he gave me some solid advice. Philip, God has a special calling on your life, and you're going to be used mightily in some type of ministry for Him. Now, some men are able to stay single, but after hearing all about your background, you'll definitely be getting married one day. Hallelujah, I shouted. That works for me. But do yourself a favor. After you get out, take time to get to know yourself again. Allow yourself some time to get used to living as a Christian out on the streets. Don't go looking for a wife. If you put God first, Your all-knowing Heavenly Father will provide you with a soulmate of His choice. But it's important that you know for sure she's God's choice. Attend church and Bible study with her. Get to know everything about her, her likes and dislikes, weaknesses, etc. Let her get to know your shortcomings, too. Make sure the relationship is anchored in the Lord, because if it is, then it will last. Thanks, brother, I responded. You have so much wisdom. What about you, Jim? I asked. Why did you get married? 
Quite frankly, I wasn't looking for a wife at all when Susie came along, responded Jim. Why, I didn't even kiss her, much less hold her hand for close to a year. Just wasn't seeking a wife at all. But deep inside, we both knew. And it'll be the same for you. You'll know. Now, let's lift up your need to the Father. Heavenly Father, we now ask you to begin preparing Philip a wife, a wonderful helpmate. While Philip is incarcerated, we ask you to begin molding her so that when it's your perfect time for them to become one, they will be perfectly matched. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. With all the crusades, my chapel work was heavier. The busier I stayed, the faster time flew by. Right in the middle of it all, revival broke out at UCI. Oftentimes, as many as a dozen Christians lined up on Sunday mornings to be water baptized. No, not in the fish pond. They did it right. One day, Brother Morgan called me into his office. Sit down, brother. We need to talk, he said. Brother Philip, he began, since being here, I've grown to recognize you as one of the strongest Christians on this compound. You've got a lot of young Christians, as well as older ones, looking up to you and following your example. As Brother Morgan continued to heap praise on me, I noticed he began slowing down, choosing his words more carefully, and I knew something was up. He hadn't called me in just to inflate my ego. I knew better than that. Brother, he hesitated. I counseled with a young Christian named Javier this morning, and he seemed quite confused. Yes, Brother Morgan, I know Javier. In fact, I also counseled him yesterday afternoon, I said. Well, yeah, that's exactly why I wanted to talk to you, said the chaplain. I'm concerned about some advice you gave Javier. As you know, he's been going through some real trials. Yes, I I told him it's important that he do exactly what the Bible says for us to do, that he should give thanks in all circumstances, no matter how difficult things might be or how rough the situation, I said. Well, that's the point, said Chaplain Morgan. Well, you see, Philip, Javier is not as mature a Christian as you are. He hasn't yet reached a level in his Christian walk where he is strong enough to do that. We have to remember babies have to learn to crawl before learning to walk. And then it still may require some time before they can even run. Hmm, I I believe I catch your drift, I said. Chaplain Morgan, I ask, do you think my advice has called Javier and maybe some other Christians to stumble? No, my brother, and don't you begin worrying, he smiled. After all, we can't have you worrying. There's a whole lot of men that'll need your advice, and we need you singing. You can't sing if your heart's full of worry, now can you? No, you sure can't. On February 1, 1981, I visited my classification officer once again, only this time Chaplain Cornette went with me. After he had gone in before me to speak on my behalf, I was called in. Mr. Hicks, he began, looking over your record, I'll have to admit you've done extremely well while here. You've graduated from the drug and alcohol abuse program, you have an excellent work record at the chapel, and you have made excellent grades in college. It's difficult to believe, but You haven't received a single bad report your entire incarceration. Hmm, won't you step back outside the door for a moment? I need to talk with the sergeant once more. As I sat on the hard wooden bench in the hallway, I thought to myself, surely they'll take at least two years off my parole date. Hicks, we're ready for you to come back in, echoed a voice from inside the office. Hicks, after careful consideration, I just don't see any real justification to make any changes on your date at this time. However, we are going to request that your security status be lowered from maximum to medium security, he finished. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, I responded as I hurriedly left. Walking briskly back to my cell, I tried not to be disappointed. After all, I reminded myself God knew just when I would be ready to leave. I also knew that there were a whole bunch of people who were now praying for me. Stopping for a moment to tie one of my shoes, I saw something shiny in the grass, reflected by the bright Florida sunshine. I reached over and picked it up, a single key attached to a solid ring. It was the inscription on the key that brought an instant smile. On one side of the key were the words, Oral Roberts University Prayer Tower, and on the flip side, the words, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a telephone number, 918-495-7777. Beneath this was an engraving of the prayer tower, which is located on the campus of Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I had seen this while watching their program on television. I also remembered that there were people up in that prayer tower praying 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
Tightly grasping my new souvenir as I hurried back to show Vic what I had found, I was reminded that there was indeed many praying for me, and it didn't matter what the parole man said. After all, I was on a much higher time schedule. Showing my key to Jess in the chapel library one afternoon, he said, Yeah, they used to send these keys out to their ministry partners. I bet one of them was sent to a prisoner who must have just thrown it away. One man's trash is another man's treasure, I said excitedly. Late one night, Vic and I were in our cell. He was painting a portrait from a snapshot while I was trying to finish a letter before the guard brought the mail around. Feliciano, came a voice from the door as a bundle of letters were placed on the ledge of the small slit in our door. Well, I said, not only did I not get this letter out, but you got all the mail tonight. Since Vic's paints were lined across his bed, I quickly got up and retrieved his mail. Hey, Felipe, said Vic, turn around. You left the letter. Now, wait a minute. I know I got all the mail that was in that window. Reaching back to grab this mysterious envelope, I immediately lit up. Hey, it's from my public defender at the West Palm Beach Court of Appeals. It's finally here. As I excitedly tore open the envelope, my heart began pounding 90 to nothing. I read the letter aloud. Dear Mr. Hicks, I have now received your transcript and file. I noticed your trial judge failed to read jury instructions, although your attorney requested the same. The Florida Supreme Court has just recently ruled that as a reversible error, but the decision is not yet final. I am now waiting for their final decision before writing your brief, since their decision will be controlling in your case. I am quite hopeful that you will then be given a new trial. Please rest assured your case is now being actively worked on, both by me and my associate, Mrs. Denise Heward. You will be hearing from her just as soon as the decision has been reached. Sincerely, Miss Cherry Grant. Assistant Public Defender, 15th Judicial Circuit. Praise the Lord, Vic and I shouted almost simultaneously. Wow, Vic, I shouted. Wouldn't this be something? This would be such a miracle. What are you excited about? Asked Victor, as he calmly brushed more paint on the landscape scene. Felipe, you've been saying all along this was going to happen, so why are you so surprised? You're always telling me with God all things are possible. Looking over at my calm, cool, and collected Puerto Rico brother, I tried to act just as calm and real religious as I said, Yes, my brother, our father's promise is to set the captives free. We both laughed as I managed to dodge the pillow that was now flying past my head. As soon as the nightly head count was finished and the doors were unlocked, I ran out of that cell and down the stairs to tell all the brothers the good news. Two hours later, I returned to find Vic fast asleep. Reflections on chapter 21. One of my favorite scripture passages is found in Jeremiah 29, 11-14, which reads, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. God is not a respecter of persons. His promises are the same for all. Just as he provided a single door key when I needed a reminder, it is God who holds the keys to our destiny. We will walk in that promised destiny when we seek him and search for him with all of our hearts and learn to be completely content regardless of our circumstances. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're with us for chapter 21. And I just pray it encourage you. Let me pray for you. Father God, I, I ask you to remind all of my friends that are watching and listening, remind them that we need to just, just take this, this walk with you one step at a time, one hour at a time, and just live circumspectly with all that's going around us. And when we make a mistake, not if, just to ask your forgiveness, get cleansed and keep on going. Father, I pray you would begin to release revelation as to who you are to those that are watching and listening, that they would know that they are amazing, they are special. And it doesn't matter how much they've done wrong in their past, that's in the past. And I pray that you would restore, restore, restore what the canker worm has destroyed, destroyed in their life or is trying to destroy. Just give them a new hope and a new future for those are the plans you have for them. And I 
pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you looking for a life-changing story that will inspire, provoke, encourage, and awaken the hearts of your prodigal sons and daughters? Look no further. The Cross and the 357 Magnum is available at www.jesusbehindbars.com. This amazing page turner is a faith builder for believers and a lightning rod for those who are in search of their true identity. Go to www.jesusbehindbars.com today and help send author missionary Philip Hicks back to prison.